Good evening, happy Halloween, and welcome back to K Red Reads. I've got a very special story for you tonight. This was written by a friend of mine named John Brustek. He works at a butcher shop in Columbus, Ohio, and every morning when they come in, there is a loaf of bread on the floor in the middle of the aisle. So he did some research on the area and came up with this very cool story. Enjoy. The Bread Ghost by John Brostek. It was 6 a.m. on a Tuesday, and the butcher was unlocking the front door of the small grocery store. It was a cold and rainy October morning, if it could really be called morning yet. It felt like it was still the middle of the night. He headed in and started turning on the lights. After clocking in, he turned towards the back of the store and headed down the aisle towards the kitchen. The coffee machine was back there, and it was absolutely imperative that the coffee was started before anything else happened. He got the pot going and wandered off to unlock the back door and turn on a few more lights. He returned to the coffee pot, grabbed the urn, and headed over to the little coffee station where the cups and creamer were kept. As he passed the bread aisle, he noticed a bag of hot dog buns on the floor. There was always some sort of bread on the floor in the morning. He stopped and put it back on the shelf, wondering who the clumsy jerk was that knocked bread on the floor every night and just left it. The spirit once again rose from its earthen sepulcher deep within the soil of the riverbank. It woke and reached for the air above it as it had every night for 300 years. It came into being during the darkest hour of the night, the time of its creation. It once had a name, though it barely could remember it. It once had a life, a purpose, hopes and dreams, but those were nearly gone. It searched for any vestiges of its former existence, physically wrestling with time and decay trying to remember what was so important that it still fought for it after so long. The memory slipped and flashed like the river's small mouth bass that had kept it company for centuries. The waters, the soil, and the roots of the pawpaw filtered through it, filling it with the ancient earth magic and giving it the power to summon the old rage back to the entity. Its consciousness flooded back into it. Leaving the canoe launch area, which he often used as a landmark, Lala Wethika silently crept upstream along the river. He slipped into the brush and briars, his buckskin clothing shedding the thorns and burrs away like an armor crafted by time and his ancestors. He watched down the high bank towards the river looking for movement, searching for the flick of an ear or the white flash of a tail. The land here was fertile and the water clean. There were always deer, ducks, and muskrats to be found here. If he was unsuccessful in his hunt, the water below held many carp, and the bottom was studded with clams. He would find his dinner, of that there was no worry. He was more interested in providing something heartier for his people. As a young man, it had recently fallen to him to begin providing for the family. Of the Wyandotte tribe, his people had wandered these woods for untold generations. They were experts at hunting the white-tailed deer that shared the trees of the river valley. His home was lined with hides, while carved antlers decorated his hair. He stopped at a large, perfectly round boulder that had fallen from the cliff face. This was a favorite resting spot of his. It was a giant sphere and the largest of many such strangely round boulders in this area. More than twice his size, if he curled up, it reminded him of the musket balls that traders shot from their muskets, just impossibly bigger. Some strange ancient energy saturated the land here to make such a wondrous formation. He wondered how they were made and for what purpose. The playthings of an ancient people? Tools for grinding acorns, perhaps? a stone shell like the ones on the snails and clams that lined the caves of his home camp. He would probably never know, but it was fun to consider while sitting here watching the squirrels chase each other through the branches above as the woodpeckers flittered around him. His people were camped a few miles away by the other river, 
A small stream had cut a ravine into the bedrock there, making a waterfall that dropped into a deep pool before running to the river. The place had always been used as a camp, and the land bore the marks of the many who had lived there. There were several mounds along the stream, obvious monuments to great ancestors, some that he and his remembered, while a larger mound was used for gathering. The water of the stream had carved several caves in the living rock there, too. The walls were lined with the stone shells of the creatures that had lived here long before he did. The caves made convenient stores for foodstuffs, and he worked hard to fill them. It was for that purpose that he was out here today. Lala leaned back and looked up the banks, scanning the ground for any sign of the various mushrooms that grew here. That was another potential harvest to be found if his hunt was unsuccessful. He spied a splash of orange around the base of an old beach, betraying the presence of chanterelles. He made a mental note of their presence just as he heard a stick snap down by the water. A small buck with two small spikes of antler was stepping down the banks to the lazily moving river. It flicked its ears against the flies and warily leaned out of the brush, eyeing the open and sun-dappled area. The deer twitched its tail and stepped towards the water while Lalawetheka silently rose and drew his bow. He sighted upon the hollow just above and behind the elbow of the deer, gently exhaling as he flicked his fingers, releasing the arrow. The arrow flew straight and struck clean. The deer immediately jumped and kicked twice before darting away, dashing through the water towards the far bank. The shot was good, though, and it was already faltering as it scrambled up the muddy bank and into the weeds and blackberries on the other side. Lala knew the work had only just begun with his shot. He waited for an hour before he stood to check on his kill, quietly giving the animal time to die. The deer had fallen no more than 20 yards into the brush and was easy to find. He said a prayer to the spirits of the forest and the deer, and then he got to work field dressing it. He worked quickly, as it would be a long walk back to camp, and he would need as much of the day as possible. It would be nearly impossible to move through the woods with this on his back once darkness came on. His preparation done, he stood the deer up and swung it across his shoulders. It was a small one, mercifully. Any larger, and he would have had to drag it out, a much more arduous task that it would take much longer. It would be good to get home, and this would feed them all for several days. He shrugged his shoulders, settling his burden, picked up his bow, and set off towards camp. The sun had just set, and Lala was still more than a mile away from his tribe when he heard the first musket shot. At first, he wasn't certain that was what he heard, but moments later, another one echoed through the woods. There was no mistaking that unnatural sound, and it was not a good sign. There was only one rifle in his tribe, and there was no way that such a precious commodity would be used frivolously. He shrugged the deer off his shoulders and began running toward the shots, now hearing screams. He couldn't imagine what violence had descended upon his people. They were peaceful and generous with the few white settlers they had ever seen. They had no enemies, and their few meager possessions were of little to no monetary value. They had never sought violence, and it had never come to them, until now. The shots continued to ring through the walnut trees. As he ran closer, his two nieces burst from the undergrowth around the creek, disheveled and covered in briars and mud. They looked at him with wide, fear-filled eyes and gestured for him to get down. As another shot cracked through the woods, he scanned for cover. He quickly ducked down behind a large log and turned to ask what was happening. Before he could open his mouth, Winona, the elder of the two, whispered one name. Deathwind. The blood in Lala's veins ran as cold as a frozen lake. The death wind was a whispered nightmare, a legend told of around fires and used to threaten children who wandered too far. A nearly mythical man named Louis Wetzel who stalked the land searching for first people to slaughter. A boy learns to hate when his society encourages it. 
when his friends and family applaud and encourage him to act on that hate. The effect of that early imprinting can govern the boy's whole life. That is what happened with Louis Wetzel. It was said that as a youth, his father and one brother had been killed by Indians. He and another brother had been taken prisoner. After escaping with his father's rifle and a pair of stolen moccasins, he had made it his life's mission to kill every native he could find. Some said that Deathwind had at least five score scalps to his name. He had killed two chiefs. He was a gigantic man who fought with a tomahawk and a musket, which he could load while running. The legend was that his rifle was always loaded. Another shot broke through the trees, and he realized that they needed to run. He had to get the girls to safety, for if it was truly Wetzel, there would be no porter. He pointed back the way he had come and ushered the girls onward. He hoped they could make it to the other river and perhaps escape in one of the canoes left there. They quickly stood and ran off to the east, away from the shots. They broke into the gathering darkness, darting between the trees and crashing through the brush. He soon heard the sounds of pursuit behind them, the impossibly consistent barrage of musket balls, cracking limbs and slapping through the leaves, left no doubt as to the identity of their foe. Their fear pushed them onwards, but soon Lala found his steps faltering. It seemed that he was stumbling over every route. He was exhausted from carrying back the deer earlier, and he didn't know how he was going to escape. The girls were slowing as well. He suddenly knew that they wouldn't make it. On that realization, he made a choice. He turned slightly to the left, veering away from the original destination. His younger niece looked back, sensing his divergence. He waved her onward and hoped that she would do so. She seemed to understand because she turned away and kept running. Lala watched them disappear into the dark woods, and then he set off to his own destination, crashing through the trees and making as much noise as he could. His ruse soon proved successful. The killer was following him, and it seemed he was gaining on him impossibly quickly. A glance back showed flickers of motion behind him, followed by yet another musket shot. He lowered his head and ran on, his legs on fire and his vision blurring. Suddenly, he felt a new burn in his chest. As the bullet tore through him, he watched the boulder in front of him crack with the impact. The strength instantly left him, and he tumbled to the ground, unable to make his legs work properly. He had made it back to the round boulders near the creek, and no further. As he lay there, he watched his blood mix with that of the white tail that had fallen on this very spot hours ago. He rolled over and looked up at the starry sky. Nobody was going to say a prayer for his last breath. Nobody was going to provide for his people. Nobody was out there protecting his tribe. Nobody would get revenge for the crimes committed today. As he lay in the tall grass on the riverside, he felt a strange heat rising towards him. Something was escaping from the broken stone and reaching out to him. Something ancient, the spirit realm. It was an elder strength built of anger and rage, but carried no name. It had lain trapped in the stone for countless ages, waiting for its time. It needed a purpose, and his was perfect. A realization passed through Lala's mind before the darkness took over. The stones were prisons, and this entity had just been set free. He embraced the power, his physical remains becoming the focus to the force of the curse. As his awareness shifted from a mortal mindset to that of a more eternal being, he realized the pain and destruction that the settlers would bring. His spirit melded with the antediluvian force and rose as a great and terrible maelstrom, whipping through the trees and chasing after his assailant. People called Wetzel the death wind, but Lala was truly become that. There would still be more killing that night, but not that of his nieces. The thing that was once Lala, but was now something more, rushed towards the canoes, crashing through the woods. He was once again the hunter, and his quarry was near. 
The girls were quickly headed downstream, but were still well within rifle range. He bore down upon Wetzel, just as the murderer was raising his rifle. Lewis turned to see what was approaching, but saw nothing. He turned back to his cruel task, just as Lala crashed into him with boar-shattering force. Lala threw the tracker forward, forcing his last shot wild. He pushed the malefactor into the river and pressed him down into the mud and slime at the bottom, holding him there long after his body stopped jerking and twitching. This body would never be found. It would receive no burial either. For centuries, Lala Wethika's bones laid there, slowly sinking into the earth that he loved. He took the form of protector of the land, guarding the trees and the river from any who were not of his people. He was a curse plaguing any who came to this spot, a silent fury in the night that brought chaos and pain to anyone who dared try to defile his home. The woods here took on a feeling of dread. As he drove people away, wildlife flourished. The water was cleaner and held more fish. The deer grew numerous and strong. Even the loggers left the massive trees here alone after a horrific incident with a saw that left three people dead. As an entity of rage and vengeance, he tore apart the cabins that the first white settlers tried to build there. He burned the cottages when the builders of Mount Air attempted to make their business there, forcing them north. But as the years passed, his strength began to wane. As his mortal remains slowly rotted away, so did his power. His influence on the land was nearly gone now. When the developers came a few decades ago, his strength was only enough to delay their progress. A flat tire on a work truck or a broken nail gun was the greatest destruction he could work. He could no longer keep them away. A building was erected upon his grave, full of white people, who bought their food instead of gathering it themselves. They paved over the land and poured poison into the river. They defiled his home in ways he could never have imagined, so his rage manifested yet again. His cursed old bones were now little more than a few loose teeth deep in the mud. His power was nearly gone, but his hatred still drove him onward. He kept fighting to keep his piece of the world clean, he had reached into the wires that fueled the building and pulled them free, setting fire to the structure and forcing its inhabitants out. But it was to no avail. They simply repaired the damage. So now, with so little of himself left, he gathered all of his power and struck out against that which he had fought for so long. He focused all of the rage and pain that was his essence and punched out at the interlopers. An unsettling wind curled down the aisle and battered a shelf. A bag of hot dog buns tumbled to the floor. And with that, Lala Wethika's tired form sank back into its grave to sleep for another night. The end. So tell me what you thought of that story in the comments. Once again, that was written by a friend of mine, John Brostek. He did a lot of research about the area where his butcher shop is. The part about the bread being on the floor is true. A lot of the other facts in that are also true. That was where the Wyandotte tribe was. All of the fires he mentions and all of the mishaps are also accurate. Lewis Wetzel was a real person and he was called the Deathwind. So this is really a piece of historical fiction. If you like these videos, click like and subscribe for more. You can also let me know your suggestions in the comments. Have a wonderful evening and come back again next time. Good night.